Well, yesterday we uh, began looking at Paul's statement of his purpose uh, in writing to the Colossian churches and what he really hoped would happen in their lives as they grow spiritually. And again, he said, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in their heart. And the very first thing he saw as a key to that encouragement was being united in love. And the reality is, no matter how much uh, the world around us may dislike us, no matter how much even family and friends may dislike us uh, or do things that hurt us, the key is that if our hearts are united in love with God and we're united with, in love with those who are closest to us, uh, that can be the greatest encouragement in life. I think that uh, somebody recently said that uh, the average person is lucky to have one or two uh, very close personal friends. If they have three, they're, they're extremely wealthy and rich. And one of the things I've found is that there are a lot of people that, uh, uh, that I think have a love for me. Uh, they have loving feelings maybe towards me. They like me or whatever. Uh, and then there's other many, many other peoples with whom I'm acquainted, but I don't have a deep relationship with them. There's a very small group of people that I could say that I'm really united in love with, and that's because in my relationship with them, they know everything about me, and they love me anyway. And uh, and uh, regardless of whether it's through thick or thin, they're going to be there. You know, they're the friends that stick with you through the difficult times, and and they work at maintaining communication, maintaining love and fellowship and friendship. Um, those are the people that you turn to when things get really difficult and you do feel discouraged and you do feel like giving up. I would just encourage you to be um, really focused on who that is, you know. I mean, for me, I, I know who the three people in my life that <laughs> are so connected to me till death do us part that, you know, the reality is they're the ones who are going to stand with me in the midst of the battle. They're always going to be on my side of the of the warfare and they're always going to be praying for me and endeavoring to see me uh, become the best that I can become in Jesus Christ. Other people, you know, they have limited endurance and when it doesn't go well, they uh, move on to where it's easier and more comfortable. But uh, that's what Paul said. He said, it's really key that you find that group of people, maybe only one, two, three people who are, are really, really tight with you and you know that they're committed to walking through this journey of life till the day you die. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing when you think about it that one day we will die and one day it'll be over and the journey will end. Uh, I've become very, very close with my, my father-in-law who's 99. We talk on, you know, three or four times a week. And uh, the thing that's really interesting is that I, I've become for him really one of his if not his closest friends. He's told me you know, all my relatives, except for my children, are all passed away. Uh, and all the people that he grew up with, I mean, his best friend Porky and Wilbur are both gone. <laughs> And, uh, those guys, such country names, I love it. And uh, his, of course, his wife Annie P. She passed away. Annie Pearl didn't ever, don't ever call her Pearl and don't ever call her Red because she had red hair. But uh, Annie P. passed away just a few years ago. And so he's really, you know, living a lot of his life alone and trying to find who can he can really connect to. And and so we talk and we connect and we have a, a real deep friendship. But I think that too many times, when, especially when we're younger, we, uh, we kind of look at acquaintances and we think, well, I've got lots of friends. You know, if I look on Facebook, I've got 900 Facebook friends or how many ever you have. The reality is that who, who really knows you? Because, you know, the old saying that if you didn't show up on Facebook one day, that they wouldn't miss you. They would just uh, they might question for a moment and then they move on to somebody else. Being united in love means there's there's a tight bond that's there, and that has to begin with our relationship with Christ, and then that handful of people that God gives us to walk the hardest parts of the journey with, who are there through through thick and thin, and those people are are not there's not a lot of them, and if you have more than one or two, you are a fortunate person. Well, moving on, Paul said his second aspect of his purpose in ministering to the Colossians. He says, so that they may be, have the full riches of complete understanding. Now, right away, we have to sit back and go, wait a minute. He's talking about having complete understanding and that is the fullest riches. In other words, understanding is the ability to have perspective on what is going on. It's the ability to look at uh, one's life in the context of a lifetime 
or to look at experiences that you're having on a daily, monthly, yearly basis, uh, to look at the world around you, what's happening on the planet with governments and nations and politics and economics and all the military things that are going, to be able to really understand all of those different dimensions of life through a single lens that gives you understanding of what really is going on. And I think that's part of the value of, of we talk about biblical knowledge. And what biblical knowledge does is it begins to tell us that in the end, uh, that we are living on a battlefield. You know, most people, as, as Tozer once said, they, they want to see life as a playground, when in fact he says it is a battlefield and we have to fight the good fight of faith every day in more ways than we can imagine. And we're often coming under attack, surprise attacks that we don't see coming. And I would just simply say, if, if you don't have spiritual battles and conflicts and things that you're going through in your life, I would really seriously take a look at, number one, am I saved? And number two, am I faithfully following God? Because one of the things that I found, unfortunately, is that Satan has limited resources and he doesn't have enough uh, minions to go after everybody. So who he spends most of his time going after are people who are earnestly seeking after the Lord. And too often I've seen people saying, I'm tired of the struggle, I'm tired of the battle, I'm tired of the conflicts. And so what they really basically want to go is an R&R, &R, rest and recovery, and they want to escape the challenges that are in front of them. I understand that. And sometimes a temporary respite can be very, very helpful. But the most refreshing respite we can take is when we go spend some time away just to spend quietly with God to, to restore ourselves spiritually. Um, when I was first in ministry, I'd go on vacation and I'd just play. I wouldn't read my Bible. I mean, I had kids and my wife and stuff, and we'd just do stuff and try to be happy. And I'd come home more exhausted than when I left. And it took me years to kind of come to the place of realizing, you know, that I really need to structure those times away from the day-to-day -day responsibilities of ministry to really focus on ministering to myself. And over time, I came to find that I need to do that every day, that the only way that you can stay fresh is to stay in the Word, in prayer, in fellowship with God. Sometimes I, I love this time of year when it's really warm and I can sit out on my deck and I can have these conversations with God. <laughs> At the same time, work on my tan. It's a double. Yeah, but the whole point is that that you begin to discover is really where the real wealth resides. The real wealth in life is it not is not in having the money that enables you to do whatever you want. The real wealth is in the riches that you find in that relationship with God because the truths of God and the experience of Christ are something that can never be taken from you. It's really interesting. I, I just started reading a book about a, a, a great man of faith, a, a, a Zulu tribesman who had become a pastor and led a small church in, in Durban, South Africa. And the man was greatly used by God. And, and uh, he never became a household name. And he, he died many years ago, back I think about, about around 83, he passed away. But he left a tremendous legacy behind him. Well, in his lifetime, he lived under apartheid, the, that basically the racial segregation that the South Africans put on people of color. And yet he wasn't a man who was burdened or defeated or enslaved. He was a man who found freedom in Christ and had a tremendously powerful ministry. And then I thought about how when he died, he went to be with heaven and it went to be with the Lord. And he felt like he was a rich man in this world, even though he was totally impoverished. And he became even wealthier when he got to heaven. And then I, my wife was recounting to me that Queen, uh, uh, the Queen passed away this morning. And uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth passed away. And uh, I thought to myself, even though she enjoyed incredible wealth, I mean, the annual income of the royal family is about... Uh, 40 million a year. They're worth billions and billions of dollars. And she had all of that luxury and all those people waiting hands and foot. I suspect that she's going to be a lot lower on the risk. If she got to heaven, she's way down on the, on the, on the importance of uh, uh, the chain of importance in heaven that this little pastor from Durban, South Africa, the Zulu pastor, is standing there very close to the friend, have, front and having a great view of Jesus and being ladled with rewards from God for his faithful service throughout all of those years. That's really how I believe it works because Paul said to the Corinthians that we give more abundant order to those par parts which don't seem to deserve it. So here was a little man that may not have been important in this world, but he was of greater importance, I believe, in heaven 
because he was faithful in following Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in him and through him. And I hope that helps you to have a better perspective on your idea, your idea of what really makes me a, a rich man, a rich woman in this world. It's the treasures of Christ. Well, we'll finish up this week tomorrow, so hang on, and I'll be back with you shortly. In Jesus' name, amen.